this second episode of the Be Right Back live podcast show. And we are in the next few weeks answering your top questions. So a few weeks ago, I emailed many of you and I said, hey, what's on your mind? What questions would you like me to answer? You get to control the show, so tell me what you want to look at. And today I'm tackling one of the most popular questions and that was, how do I overcome the overwhelm that I feel and start training? And so many of you said that. So that's what we're looking at today. Hello if you're watching live and if you're watching on replay, hello to you as well. If you're watching on replay, put hashtag replay and then I'll pop into the comments later in the week after we've gone live and make, made sure that I check um, and come back to you. Here's how we're going to do it today. So I'm going to cover this topic of how you can control that overwhelm. I'm going to share my tips for you for getting started, how to stop that feeling and actually take some action. I'm also going to take your questions on this subject or on separation anxiety more generally. If you have a question for me while we're watching live, pop in the comments and write down your question as soon as it comes to your head. Because if, it's, if you're anything like me, by the time it comes to the point where we're actually doing questions, that question might have gone. So make sure when the question comes to mind, you pop in the comments and always put Q at the start of a question so that I know it's a question rather than a comment, all right? And Suzanne has beaten me to it because the next thing I wanted to say was, tell me where you are in the world. And of course, very important, let me know if you're watching with your pup and what your pup is called. Um, I like to know breed as well, that's always, always interesting. So three things, where you are, <laughs> if your dog is watching with you, of course they are, their name and breed. And um, if you are joining at any point, do the same. So you, <laughs> your dog's name and breed and where you are in the world. Um, and questions start with a Q. And that is it. Um, hello, Archie and Laurie, saying hi to you. Um, oh, that's interesting. You aren't coming up for me on Facebook refresh, re refreshing um, screen for me yet. Okay, so well, we'll got, we've got a few people watching, Patty. I know, I think Ashley's watching, maybe Jason's watching. So we'll have a look for you. Um, because I can see that Laura's watching on Facebook, Susanna's watching on Facebook, so it's weird, Patty, that I'm not there for you yet. Um, uh, hi from Florida with my Havanese named Harley. Uh, Linda's in... Well, I know where Linda is. Linda's in the Netherlands. She's got Yara Storm. Netherlands? Netherlands? I just invented a country. Um, Yara Storm and Shadow. Hi, Kendall. How's Charlie doing? Um, Babs was watching in Stoke-on-Trent with Maggie, a Pugalier. Oh, so cute. Hi, Dominique in Belgium. Um, it's all good on Facebook. Okay. Oh, and top marks here from, and Facebook's not showing me your name, but thank you for putting question ahead of the question. Our little buddy is waking up way too early. Um, we will come on to that later. Uh, Jonathan's in Vancouver. Ah. Oh, practically neighbors. Um, okay, so next question for you all. How many of you, either right now or at some point since you discovered your dog had separation anxiety, have you felt overwhelmed? You can just give me a yes or you can give me a, a, a hand, a wave in the comments. How many of you at some point have felt overwhelmed? And I'm talking here about whether you've been feeling overwhelmed about the training or you felt overwhelmed about the whole process. Uh, Jenny's saying yes, Jenny on YouTube. Hi, Jenny on YouTube. Watching in Michigan with Mr. Pickles, says N. Peterson. Um, yeah, we've got a few yeses. Yes, yes, yes. Ah, so many yeses. And it's a really common feeling. So not only have you got a dog who you suddenly discover you can't leave, but then on top of that, you're trying to search for a solution because you can't live with that situation forever. And all of that together, many, many times over, makes you feel like, I can't do this, right? We've all felt that. I want to give up. I want to give up, but at the same time, I want my dog to get over separation anxiety. I'm not sure I can take this anymore. I'm worried for my dog. I'm worried for my friends and family who haven't seen me forever. I'm worried for me. 
And so there's a lot and lot of that. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. First of all, I see people fall into three camps when it comes to separation anxiety training, the condition and overwhelm. And I'm going to talk to you about the three camps I see. And I'm really interested if you let me know which one you think you fall into. So the first camp I see are people who feel really overwhelmed because they think they've tried separation anxiety training and it just didn't work. So now you're left with this feeling of, well, I did what I was told. I you know, read up about it. Maybe you got my book. I did what I was supposed to do and I tried it and I'm just not getting there. And that is what le leaves you feeling completely overwhelmed. You've given it your best shot. You've put effort and time and energy into it and you just don't feel like you're getting anywhere. And even if you are getting somewhere, even if you are seeing some progress, you've done the maths and you've looked at it and you've said, well, heck, if we were only at three minutes now, if I do the maths, it's gonna take until my dog's 12 to get him over separation anxiety. So I see that as being like the first camp, the first bucket, tried it, didn't work it, and that's left, didn't work, it didn't work, and that's left you feeling overwhelmed. The second group I see are people who are scared to start. And I hear that a lot. If you're thinking, oh my goodness, no, I haven't started separation anxiety training. I actually feel too scared. Like how come everybody's training except me? So my second group is people who are scared to start. And often it's because you are afraid of the kind of enormity of the task, but it's not always that. Sometimes people tell me they're scared to start because they almost don't want to see it not working. So they don't want to become group one. They don't want to fall into the tried it and didn't work. It's like, okay, I think this could work. I read about it. People talk about it. But what if it doesn't work? What if it doesn't work for my dog? So I don't, I'm not sure if I want to start it because I'm just not prepared for what might happen if it didn't. So I see they're sort of scared to start. And by the way, if you're feeling either of these things, tried it, didn't work, feel overwhelmed, too scared to start, just dreading it, that's okay. It's perfectly normal and you are not the first person to feel that way. The third camp I see, and sometimes you can be in more than one of these camps, many of you will be in this third camp and that is, well, you know what, I am so confused. I'm completely, completely lost here because I'm just getting so much advice from different trainers or different things I read on the internet or, you know, when I go to Amazon and look for products that might help me with separation anxiety, everything, everything seems different. And sometimes it seems conflicting. Amazon tells me I need to buy an anxiety crate for my dog with separation anxiety. But, you know, I've read books that say don't crate your dog or, um, you know, people in groups I'm in have said get a second dog and then lots of other people say, no, 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 don't do that. So the third group, and many of us are almost always in this group, feel confused and overwhelmed by their volume of advice. The thing I want to say to you if you're in three is think about the difference between advice and opinion. And it's not always easy for you to work that out. But for example, comments made in Facebook groups that aren't well moderated, I'm really proud of our Facebook group because I think our amazing moderator team do a really good job of weeding out bad information. But if you're in a Facebook group, say you're in a Havanese, um, Havanese breed group and people are telling you what to do about separation anxiety in there, if they're not trainers who have studied separation anxiety and worked with a ton of cases of separation anxiety, they're giving you their opinion, but it's not really the same as advice. Be, be certain of your source. So when you're getting confused and conflicted, just say to yourself, is this advice from somebody who really knows about separation anxiety? Or is this just the opinion of my friend's friend when we met down the pub the other week because my friend's friend's brother's sister-in-law had a dog with separation anxiety and what they did was they just let it cry out. So if you're in the confused, uh, overwhelmed with advice, challenge yourself. Is it advice? Or is it opinion? Because only listen to advice that's gonna make you feel way better and definitely reduce that overwhelm. 
All right, let me dive into the comments. A mixture of all three, says Jenny. Um, Nikki is worried about starting training. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? You, you want to do it. You want to do the training. You want to get your dog over separation anxiety, but it can really, it's really weird. You can, you can really get hold back by your, your thoughts and whatever other people say to you. Um, don't forget to put Q in your comments if you want me to answer your question. Uh, camp too scared it won't work and then I'll have a lifetime of worrying about leaving her yeah so scared about something that could work that we don't want to try it yep so been there um hard to stay positive yes I know um oh combining training with other challenging behaviors yeah that's really tricky we should come back to that um, don't forget to put a cue in front of it if you want me to answer your question. If you've already put a comment and there's a question in that comment, post again um, and make sure that I see it as a question. Dominique says group two, Karen group one, two and three. And I think most of us have probably been in three at some point, haven't we? So we're maybe in one or two plus three. Yeah, but I don't want you to Obvi no, it's fine. So it's fine, Alison. I'll try and find it. It just, I'm, you can see how many comments are coming through. Hard for me to track, that's all. All right, so let's do a quick refresh then of what separation anxiety training involves. Let's just make sure that the thing we're worrying about, the thing that's causing us to feel overwhelmed is actually the same thing, right? Because maybe you're being overwhelmed by something that isn't separation anxiety training. If you are being told to uh, leave a Kong or get a second dog or just let your dog cry it out or get an anxiety crate, you can forget all of that. Because the tried and trusted method, and as recently as um, maybe six months ago, a really comprehensive paper came out and said, actually from all of the things that are out there that might help a dog with separation anxiety, the thing that does is this. It's gradually exposing your dog to alone time. It's kind of weird, isn't it? Your dog doesn't like being alone, but the way you get it to be, get him or her to be okay with being alone is you actually expose them to alone time. It's the way that we treat human phobias, but it's very different from letting your dog bark it out. That's exposing your dog to home alone time. But the way that, it, way that we do it and the way that it works is we have to make sure that alone time is short enough. The intensity, as we call it, is low enough that your dog goes, oh yeah, no problem, I can do this alone time, even if it's a second, or even if it's just starting with opening and closing the door. So we call it gradual exposure to the scary thing. We are desensitizing your dog because your dog is currently sensitized to being left. So we need to change that thought pattern in your dog's brain. We need to change it from, oh, every time she goes out, it's horrendous to, yeah, I can do this, no problem. So going back to that point I made about advice versus opinion, if you're reading anything and it doesn't fit that training principle, gradually exposing your dog to tiny amounts of alone time, increasing the amounts as you go along, then chances are you're not getting advice from a trusted source who really understands separation anxiety training. I know that sounds really simple and there's a lot more to it, as many of you know who are thick in the training, but I just wanted to make sure that we're clear about what the training does look like. And in fact, there are lots of reasons why the training will go terribly. And that includes when we have to leave our dog for longer than they can cope with, that can really affect things. Or when we're trying to create our dog, that can sometimes, often, slow down progress. But I know, there's many of you in the comments who are trying the training, not doing any of those other things and are still finding it slow. And it is, and it is, hand on heart, it is slow. And I think that on its own might stop you from wanting to start in the first place. But I saw an amazing comment from one of my um, separation anxiety heroes in my paid membership group last week. And she said, yeah, it's taken me months to get to where I am now. But what else was I gonna do in those months? Well, basically what she's saying is whether you train using gradual exposure or whether you do nothing, the time will pass anyway. The time will pass anyway. 
what's the cost of training and not training in those six or seven months? Well, there's your time, there's your emotion, because certainly not doing anything is often less jangly on the nerves than trying the training and finding that you're regressing and you're having ups and downs. But it's a really good point, isn't it? You could not do anything or you could do some training and in six months time, six months have passed anyway. Do you see the point I'm making? Uh, so it's from my perspective, if we can help you quell those fears about starting, it's got to be worth trying. Um, yeah, Monica says the AKC advocates this exposure approach as well. And Monica, it's great. I'm seeing more and more sources who advocate that, which is so good to see. Um, right, let me go back. I'm gonna take some questions now. So if you want me to answer questions, put a cue. Uh, at the start of your comment. Alison says, my Velcro golden doodle is only left with my mum if I have to go out. I work from home. My husband passed away six months ago. Oh, I am so sorry. <sighs> and my dog is even worse when I leave him with my mum. I'm worried that I may have to leave him if an emergency occurs. Help. So Alison, you're... the good news is, and there is some good news here, helping a dog be okay with other people when they're left is actually easier than helping a dog be totally okay with alone time. So in the rank order of things that your golden doodle dreads, being completely on their own is the biggest, is the biggest worry. For your golden doodle who's Velcro attached to you, hyper attached, being with somebody else other than you is not good. It's not as good as being with you. And I call that the least worst alternative, but it's not as bad as being alone. So what you can do for your sanity, for your peace of mind, for just having a tiny bit of freedom is I would focus your training efforts, Alison, on getting your golden doodle to be okay with your mum or maybe other people in their life. So you're going to think about broadening your golden doodle circle of trust and how you do that is with short trips, short um, stays, short sit, short time with other people. It could be a mum, it could be a friend, it could be a pet sitter. And when they, when your golden doodle, I don't know their name, but when your golden doodle is with your mum or your friend, they're going to have a massive party. So your mum's gonna throw a party and it could, a chicken party is a great party to throw for most dogs. We want to make that time that your golden doodle spends with other people just as amazing as the time that in their head when they spend with you. You've got to remember, for all of you who've got a hyper-attached Velcro dog, and I know there are many of you, you've got to remember that your dog didn't come into the world thinking that it was all about you. You know, they spent at least eight weeks without you. So if they can form that slightly unnatural bond to you, overly strong, they can create a bond with other people too. You didn't give birth to them, so they can definitely bond with you later in life or with other people, and that's our goal. So do check out a podcast I've done on hyper-attachment, um, and also um, have a look in both my books. I spend a lot of time talking about hyper-attachment. There's lots of things that can help you, and that's where I would spend my time. Gaina says, question, if my dog falls asleep after a couple of minutes, can I count this time as asleep as meeting his target? Yeah, the main thing, Gaina, is did your dog see you go out? And if so, you can just continue on. We want them to know we've gone. We don't want them to not realize we've gone and then wake up in the middle of a step and go, whoa, where is everyone? But if your dog's seeing you go, then you are good. Hi, Susanna. Two little mate cockapoos, Coco and Ralph. Oh, Ralph seems more nervous than Coco, although we'll eventually set Coco off. They used to they used to howl after barking. Have started your training and it's going well after after a week. Two questions. Should we contain them in one room and should we leave a treat? Ralph used to be quiet for up to 30 minutes but would bark when it was finished. Coco wouldn't eat hers until we came back. Very grateful for this advice as literally at the end of my tether. Yeah, I don't blame you. And they are, are they young? Um, and I'm sure they've got lots of energy and they keep you on their toes as it is. 
So most dogs, Susanna, do better when left when they've got a bit more space. So play around with that and just test it out. If you are worried about them getting into things, then just stop access to the things rather than um, reducing the amount of space that they've got. You don't need to treat them because you coming back um, oh, and actually don't leave a treat when you go because that really confuses things and you can see Coco's not eating the treat anyway. We want them to get used to you going without any props. So, and when you come back, that's an amazing treat for both of them anyway. So they're gonna get a big reward when you come back. So I would think about probably more space, not less. I would also want to just check that there's no noise setting Ralph or Coco off. Um, if Ralph's a bit nervous, maybe there's some noise that's setting Ralph off outside. So you might want to factor that into where you leave them to. But usually the rule is more space is better than less. Mm -mm. This is a really good point. Um, yeah, making progress, but it's slower than I'd like. And sorry, Facebook isn't popping up with your name. Um, but I'm in camp one, somewhat making progress, but it's slower than I'd like. The bigger challenge is my partner so frustrated. I'm more patient. My partner doesn't agree with the approach, wants to just leave him longer. Also, challenge of excitement, reactivity to visitors, guests already not going out as much, but also feel challenged as guests are, yeah, challenging to have with Bailey. So hopefully you're getting help with the, the visitor situation. Um, and excitement and reactivity are two very different things when it comes to dogs who like, dogs and people. If you've got a dog who loves people and is getting overexcited, then that's a much easier problem to work on than a dog who is wary of people, who gets spooked by them, who gets really aroused by them because they don't like people. So dogs can react to people that's why reactivity is such an unhelpful word when we're talking about dogs and we use it all the time but it doesn't describe what's going on so if your dog's really excited at seeing people and loses it that's going to be a very different problem to fix than your dog doesn't like people and loses it so if it's the former then i hope you're working with somebody anyway um, but that should be easier to resolve um and as for patience, I know, I find a lot of people will at some point, no, not maybe not you, but maybe your partner will feel the need to try the cry them out. But there's plenty of people, as you know, in the group who've tried that and it's made things worse. So it's a huge risk and it can be a really crappy time for the dog. Does it sometimes work? Yeah, and here's how it works. It works by flooding the dog, by completely drowning them in exposure to the scary thing until they kind of just submit to it. So even if it does work, it's a horrible experience for your dog, but there you go. I'm sure you're in the camp of, yeah, I'm not gonna do that. Um, question, is working with a separation anxiety expert one-to-one -one better, different with working with your online course or using your book? Um, brilliant question. The way I explain it is, and if you're a gym goer, this will make sense, and if not, maybe it won't. Uh, but like the gym I go to, uh, I could if I felt I really needed that extra help and I wanted to, you know, spend the money on it, I could go and book a one-to-one -one personal trainer. And people who have one-to-one -one personal trainers will say that they get, you know, better results than the next level, which is people who go to a class. But in a class, like my online class, my Separation Anxiety Heroes, you're still getting a lot more uh, TLC and personal interaction even though it's online with my separation anxiety heroes, you are getting advice from trainers direct to you. Like you can get your uh, video of your dog reviewed, for example, a video of your dog's threshold during training, that kind of thing. And then the book or the Facebook group or these free Facebook lives, I see as more like, you know, you want to get fit so you go and watch YouTube videos. So it's there's something for everybody um, and yeah, I guess the, the gold standard, the Rolls Royce, as people of my age would say, is the one-to-one. -one. But if you want to spend a bit less money and want to be in the membership, that's another approach. And if you want to do it pretty much for free, because you can, not for free, but the book is five pounds, is the cheapest option, then those are the levels. That's how I see it. Oh, okay, such great questions. Um, Jonathan in Vancouver. Um, 
During separation anxiety training, our dog started crying at night. We live in a flat where the bedrooms are on the second floor and she sleeps open on the main floor. Oh, we have a six month old baby, which prompted the anxiety, but also makes the evening crying a bit challenging. Any suggestions for what to do with this nighttime behavior? Um, how old is your dog now, Jonathan? Um, so I would make sure, and it's, can you just come back and tell me, is it, I'm just trying to read the question again, mm -mm -mm. crying at night. So is it during the night, so after you've all gone to bed, or is it like nighttime, evening, when you're trying to be like calm and everything? All right, one last question before I go on to my third question. Uh, point today. How many times a day should I do desensitization training? If you're on a really short duration, you can do several times. I mean, at least a couple. Um, as you increase that duration, see how your dog does. Some dogs still do well with, you know, a couple of different sessions a day or some sessions back to back. You're going to know. You're going to know because your dog will just go, no, no, not doing it. Not That's too much. But when you're on short durations, you can definitely do more rather than less. Mm -mm. About five minutes after we go upstairs. Wow, that's quite young. That's that's old for, and that's the separation anxiety kicking causing that. Um, and so this that only happened when the separation anxiety training started. Hmm. So. That says to me, that worries me a little bit. Well, it worries me quite a lot, actually, Jonathan, because it says to me the training might be sensitizing her, which it can do. You can do it as well as you think, and sometimes it can sensitize them. And there's definitely one where I'd want to see a video of the training. I'm sorry, I can answer most questions on here, but at some point I kind of go, ah, I'd really like to see her when you're doing the training. And I'd really like to see that reaction when you go upstairs. Obviously, you don't want her upstairs with you because you've got the baby upstairs. That's what lots of people do in the short run, short term. In the, the other way to do it, and you'll know this because you've got a six month old baby, is you can go and resettle, go and resettle, go and resettle. And what you do is you gradually increase the time that you spend with them when you resettle. Because you know that she's okay, because you know that all needs are met, you can go no, you're going to go back to bed, go back to bed nice and light and brightly. And then you go back to bed and she'll cry again. So you get up. It's called the night of a thousand walks. And, you know, anybody with um, a baby who hasn't slept will understand that principle too. And you kind of, it almost breaks you, but you go through the process until your dog kind of goes, oh yeah, so I guess crying doesn't really um, change the situation and I am okay. So, all right, I'll stick with it. Um. Now it's gonna seem weird as well, um, Jonathan, but I would suggest you grab my puppy book. If you haven't got a book already, grab my puppy book. You're like, why do I need a puppy book? Because nighttime anxiety, nighttime crying is a really big deal with most puppies. So I major in on it in the puppy book. So, um, you know, grab the audio book or grab the, sorry, grab uh, the, what am I trying to say? The ebook and maybe flick through that section. All right. Okay, so we've we've been talking about the, the overwhelm and the fear of starting and we're kind of stuck in a really gloomy place here. So I want to change it to a more hopeful and more positive place, I think. Here's what I think you want to do. Here's what I want you to do. If you're in a situation where you just like, you can't start or you stopped and you can't pick up again. The first thing, and this sounds really trite, but I'm going to say it. Try not to overthink it. If you overthink the what ifs, what if my dog doesn't get over this? What if I have a terrible regression? What if my partner just gets really impatient? Our brains are wired to catastrophize. When we think about potentially bad things in the future, we are hardwired to create catastrophes out of those. Think about it. Think about any time in your life when you've worried about something potentially not great in the future, you've worried about stuff. When it happens, it's the, the situation isn't different, but your brain deals with it differently. I'm not gonna say, um, you know, we worry about stuff in the future and then it's all okay. The stuff still happens to us, but our brain treats it very differently. So our brain is much better at being rational and at assessing a threat 
in the present than it is at assessing a threat in the future. Um, I'm so guilty of this. I'm one of the world's biggest catastrophizers and I have to stop myself from doing it so I know how it goes. And thinking about it, worrying about it, catastrophizing about it, overthinking it isn't isn't going to help us, right? We need to bring our brain back to the present and stop the, but what if? So that's the first thing I want you to do. Stop. Stop right now. And link to that, try not to keep looking to the end of the training. In the past, I've often used the comparison with separation anxiety training and say, getting fitter, learning, uh, starting to train for a marathon or learning a in a musical instrument or losing weight because they're all very slow processes where you see small changes um, on a you know not a fairly regular basis but it takes a while to get to the point of accomplishment whatever that is for you the problem with all of those is they are way more linear than changing emotions so with weight loss you know it's not guaranteed but there's a good chance that if you focus on, you know, a calorie count of X um, and you do it over X weeks, you sort of know that if you stick with that, you'll probably get to your goal weight in X time. Same with a marathon. If you follow a training plan and you give yourself, you've never run before, you could, you could run a marathon in 26 weeks if you followed a, a training plan. You might get injured, there might be wobbles, but barring all of that, you'll just plod along steadily. Where it on where it's so it's a reasonable comparison in some sense, but the problem with separation anxiety training is there are more wobbles, there are more injuries, there are more things that don't go wrong, but it's just that emotion doesn't work that way. So if we think about the end and we try and calculate how long and we plot it out because we're used to being, you know, really planned and really organized, that trips us up because that's not how it's going to work. So we need to let go of that. And it's really hard because we want a, you know, a certain time, we have expectations about that. But James Clear in his fantastic book, and go and grab this book if you haven't already, Atomic Habits by James Clear. I feel like he must have had a dog with separation anxiety, although he didn't, because he talks about the nuts and bolts of going through a difficult change. He's talking about the human brain in that context. And he talks about something that really sticks in my mind in that book is he says, winners and losers have the same goal. Now, I don't like dividing us up into winners and losers, but he's talking about, for example, sports teams. So all sports teams want to win their league. They want to win the cup, but only one of them will ever do that. So they all have the same goal. All of us here, you all want to get your dog over separation anxiety. So you all have the same goal. He says, but what separates out the champions from the you know the ones who didn't get there isn't that goal because the goal is the same it's the process it's the process that they use and it's a focus on the process so he's all about let go of those big goals and those expectations you can have them but just like imagine you're putting them up on a shelf somewhere so they're up there right they're up there instead focus on today focus on tomorrow just take tiny steps and focus on the process and you do, number three, you need a system and you need a process. And that's why I'm so passionate that you join my group and watch the free videos or buy my book or join my paid membership, Separation Anxiety Heroes, and follow the app. Because the people who have most success just knuckle down and follow a process, just day by day by day, and reach out for help when it goes wrong because there are days when things wobble and that's natural and normal for separation anxiety training. It's way better to think about separation anxiety training and recovery as similar to recovery from say grief or emotional trauma in people because that's not linear. Um, and you, you know, if you know anybody who's been through grief or if you've been gr through grief yourself, you know you can't put a time frame on it. There's no, you know, in three months I'll feel great again. In fact, in three months, you might feel as bad as you feel today, but you might have felt brilliant between now and three months because that's just how the brain deals with uh, overcoming negative emotion. Okay, number four. So this is a do something today. This is to do, I want you to do something today. I want you to overcome that fear and that dread, which is essentially causing us to procrastinate by taking a teeny step. So there's tons and tons of research that says 
when we're stuck, when we feel like we can't do something and we're overwhelmed, what gets us started is doing something tiny. Like it's so tiny. Um, so what might that be? It could be if you haven't joined my Facebook group, go and do that. Just go and do it and have a look around, right? Because it's not going to take, there's not much friction there. There shouldn't be a big barrier to doing that. Or maybe it is buy my book. Maybe it is, you know, listen to another podcast episode. Or maybe it's I've got the book and the plans are in the back. So I'm going to dig out the plans. And it might not be I'm going to start training today or tomorrow because I know it's late in um, Europe now. But it's just something so teeny that what happens is you kind of, the, you open up the floodgates. So once you do that teeny thing, it unlocks everything, okay? Um, I don't know why, but I always think of the skim on custard. Why do I think about that? Where when you do a tiny little break in it, then everything kind of just goes bleh. So, um, or, or popping a balloon, right? It's so tiny, but a huge amount of action comes as a result. So what I'd love you to do is pop into the comments and say, one teeny, tiny, tiny thing I can do today is this, and make it so teeny that it's just not threatening and it's not hard. If you do that and you pop that in the comments and you do it and you take that step, do that action, you're gonna feel so much better. And guess what that does? It makes you take the next step and the next step and the next step. Okay. <sighs> I talked a lot. Um, I am going to go back to those questions. Let's have a look. Mm -hmm. Emma says, my dad is helping with dog care. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah, can my dad train him in my house when I'm not in? If so, will the dog transfer the time increments to me when I come to training? Um, say my dog got him to five minutes this week. Can I continue from five minutes? Also, can my dad train him in his own house and should he check to see if there's a different baseline? So, uh, there are a couple of it depends. I think this is a great idea, by the way, Emma. Um, it depends on whether your dog reacts differently to being left when you do the leaving, when your dad does the leaving. However, I would still say it's worth it because um, it might be the case that we are, I, I've often often seen a situation, time and time again, in fact, where one person does the leaving, the dog does better. And so actually that gives you a bit more hope and a bit, a bit more of an option. You've got more options. So I would definitely try it. If you find that your dog being left when your dad does the training versus you do the training, there's a very big difference in the time that your dog can cope with, then set up what I call two scenarios. Now you can do this manually, uh, people who use my app do this naturally because we set it up in the training app. But you're basically going to think of like following two different training paths. So that's what scenarios are. So they'll be like, dad does the leaving, you do the leaving. Um, and yes, yeah, see if he's up for training in his own house. Because again, it's, it's, not, it's not so common. But there are instances where dogs in another place with somebody else doing the training sometimes do better. Often they do worse. But let's see. Because then also when your dog goes and stays with your dad... If your dad can get your dog to be okay and your dad does the training. By the way, can I just say, your dad's amazing. Your dad is, is everybody thinking, wow, Emma's dad's amazing. But yeah, try it in your dad's house because that could be a really good option too. If the training works there, your dad's got a bit more freeman. But yay to your dad. Um, so... Mm -hmm. Sarah says, I'm doing separation anxiety training using the snuffle mat. I sometimes try doing it when uh, he's just lying on the bed, but he always starts falling asleep. He always falls asleep when I'm relaxing with him. Could I still do departures when he's so relaxed that he's falling asleep? Yep, absolutely. Yep, very much so. Very much so. Um, so, yeah, as long as I see you going, I think I mentioned it a few minutes ago, as long as I see you leave. He's very excited by them. So, you know, that's that's going to be easier to deal with it's not easy but it's way easier to change uh, to change the environment and change things up so that an excited dog who gets really excited at seeing people um is kind of less excited or is easier to manage than a dog who's f scared of people mm 
Yeah, Maz says I can't leave my dog at all unless with a human. Yeah, very common. And most people on here are saying that too. Um, Monica, that's what we're all about. The Heroes Group, that's my Separation Anxiety Heroes membership, um, is the way to go. I've made a lot of progress and I'm feeling mo more hopeful overall. And that's that's the goal. That's the goal of that group is to give you structure and hope and support. Um, so I'm glad you think that do it does that. Mm -mm. My dog is not left for any periods, uh, for any long periods, but sometimes I don't have a choice to leave her for an hour due to work where we have no one else can watch her. Will I still be able to do the training? Although sometimes we'll have no choice but to put her over the threshold. Well, I think that goes back to what I was saying at the start of, well, you could not do the training or you can continue doing what you're doing. And if you continue doing what you're doing, you're going to be continuing doing that anyway. Well, that sounds like gibberish. But my point being is, why not try? Why not try? Lots of dogs don't do well with the training if you have to leave them. And I know that people aren't leaving their dogs because they, they don't care. I know that you're doing it because despite the fact that you really care for your dog, I know that. But I would say try it. Just see. Um, you know, and it's it, not doing anything is probably the, the, the option that's right at the bottom here. So I would say give it a go. James says, uh, watching in Tunbridge Wells, um, four-month-old Cavapuchon Finnegan is snoozing. Oh, so cute. Jonathan says, she usually goes to the door when we leave the home and then lies down and relax, but I haven't been able to get her to stay away from the door. So normally the door is, like hanging by the door is normally fine, Jonathan. Um, because lots of dogs are going to do that. Lots of dogs do do that when we do the training, even though they're okay, they're just like in watch and wait mode. Um, but it depends whether there's other signs of anxiety too. At night, she will not be at the base of the stairs, but in the main area, panting, standing and crying, right? She sounds really upset. So one thing you could try, let's just see if the training is causing this. So I would suggest to take a little break from the training and let's see if that changes things because I am a little bit worried here. That's quite extreme that she suddenly started doing this panting, standing, crying. Um, so it could be the training, but also I'm sure you've done this. Just rack your brain for anything else that could have changed. Uh, is it is it the weather? Did this start over the summer? Is it is it did it start when the six month old came in or only when the separation anxiety training came in? Not when your six month old baby came. I mean, when the baby came or did it start afterwards? Um, but Pat, like Patty says, although the puppy book is geared for puppies, it covers problems that dogs can have at any time in their life. So that would be a good place to start. Um, and if you need more support, J Jonathan, I called you James, sorry, then come and join us in Separation Anxiety Heroes. Yeah, and when you focus on the process, um, it's, it's, it's liberating because you know you can just celebrate today's successes and what actually one of the things we do in separation anxiety here is as you know monica is we celebrate the you know the successes but we also are there for each other on the down days because the down days happen all the time linda says it's not one day but today is day one uh, tomorrow uh, kendall says tomorrow i'll work on the doors of ball with the living room so it's easy to train and kendall the thing i need to say to you is You've got an awful lot going on. I think you're amazing that you're dealing with all that you've got, um, you know, uh, with your your schedule and your commitment and doing all of this too. And on top of that, I want to say huge kudos to you because you came back a couple of weeks ago and you lent into the group and that's what we're here for. Okay, so Laura's got an easy goal. Setting up a new camera. Yes, yes, yes. Kendall's going to work on Dora's boar. Your dad is amazing. You're welcome, Emma. Step by step. Yes, Dominique, I sometimes worry about how, where I have to spend the time outside once the training starts. Right, Dominique. Yes, Dominique says, um, I'm worrying about, I sometimes worry about what am I going to do when the duration increases. Let's work on that when you get there. I mean, there's lots of things you can do. Um, and I don't mean to uh, minimize your concerns because your concerns are valid. 
I just mean that's a great example of let's not worry about that until it becomes a problem. That's so my so my fault. I'm so bad at that. So a fault of mine. Um, Neil is here on Facebook, so no name visible for you. Yes, and thank you for putting your name. It's only if you're in the Facebook group. If you're on the Facebook page, it's confusing, I know. Um, our dog is 10 months old, is waking up early in the morning around 5 a.m. Oh, sorry, you posted that earlier. Um, and then starts whining and barking until we go downstairs. When we are downstairs, he falls asleep within minute, minutes. Um, is that due to separation anxiety? It starts a couple of week, weeks ago. No, it sounds like... Um, to me, that sounds like, oh, okay, downstairs. And he's sleeping downstairs. So I think, Yildiz, you need to do what I was suggesting to Jonathan, which is if you think your dog is okay, you're going to keep going down and resettling until your dog realizes that, you know, nothing is going to happen. You're not going to come and sleep with them downstairs. They've slept eight hours on their own up to that point. They can do it. Um, and again, that's in the puppy book. It's a killer and I've done it. I actually did it with, um, back in the day when I used to try and get Percy to be, to sleep in his crate at night. And I spent ages and ages and ages crate conditioning him, getting to love his crate. Why did I want him in this crate at night? Because I used to have really bad insomnia and it was not a good combination, a wriggly dog and, um, an insomniac. So I spent months trying to get him to be okay and it's great. And then we built up the time overnight. And then some nights he'd just go, I don't want to be in here. How did I know it wasn't anxiety? I knew. I had the data. I had the difference between his cries when he was anxious and his cries when he was like, so you open the toy cupboard and can you get the treats out? Uh, but I didn't, at the same time, I didn't want to let him cry it out. So I wasn't doing that either. So it's similar to the night of the thousand walks. It would just be open the crate no, you're fine, but pop back in, open the crate, no, you're fine, pop back in, open the crate, no, you're fine, pop back in. You find that the latency increases so the amount of time between those steps. You have to know that they're okay though. If he was freaking out and anxious in his crate, I wouldn't have done that. But he was just like, hmm, bed's up there, quite fancy that. Fast forward, I'm no longer an insomniac because I spent a lot of time working on that. He's old, he's not gonna be here for much longer. He's on the bed now. Yay, Sarah, that's great. Um, oh my goodness, I'm I'm gonna take one last question. Um, managing question about managing training with reactivity. Um, the number one thing I can say is you. Uh, you've only got well you've only got limited training hours and emotion so it's prioritizing and it's prioritizing based on which is going to make most difference to your life which can you manage and which is going to make most difference to your life and you can't manage it so it's often a tough choice and both of those if it's theory activity then that takes longer to resolve um, sorry, and your name didn't pop up. Are you the lady that's talking about theory act um, your dog getting excited? And if I actually that's the case, I'd work on both of those because you'll resolve the um, excitedness not quickly, but in a time that frame that you'll be pleased with. Um, okay, Sarah says, my goal is to get to 38 seconds. Fantastic. All right, so I normally finish at quarter two and I've gone over. Um, but thank you so much for joining me today. I will be back again next week for another topic. If you, ha if you have a topic that you want me to cover, make sure you let me know. You can post in the groups. Um, you can post on this post. You can email me. Um, and if you have questions, we'll be answering questions again. If you want more time with me, join Separation Anxiety Heroes, which is now open. Um, and you can actually, somebody was asking for that earlier, so let me just put that here. Um, you can find the link here. And I'm gonna go off, get a cup of tea, and then I'm gonna dive into a private Facebook discussion with my separation anxiety heroes. So heroes, you're gonna see me again in about 10 minutes. Everybody else, thanks again for joining me. Hope to see you this time next week. All right, bye for now, everyone.